have to admit, and I sometimes tell people this, man, I am the most spoiled Christian in the world. <laughs> At least that's the way I think of it. I think of myself as being pretty spoiled, actually. You know, I was pretty lucky, or I hate that word lucky, because really I was spoiled. I mean, I didn't grow up in the church, you know, and that's kind of like a detriment, because I know some people think, oh, I grew up in a church, and man, they just ruined me, you know, and now I know better, so I don't go to church. Excuse me? <laughs> Excuse me again? Okay. So you don't go to church, heathen? <laughs> but when I got saved, I was spoiled rotten, because, uh, yeah, yeah, I you know, admit, I had to, it cost me something, you know, I had to live in my car for a while, and eventually find some Christian roommates and live with them and things were challenging for me in a lot of ways but once things started rolling you know even while they were going on it was so neat because I had a chance to be like at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa kind of like in a kind of in a crossroads time it was just after the tent and they had built the sanctuary you know and things were growing and different ministries were you know being built up and different things were changing you know and it was the times of you know transitioning from MEA and different people were going off on different tangents and things were just starting to get organized with pastors, you know. It was kind of like, uh-oh, the church is really growing. <laughs> well, I worked at, you know, the tape lending library behind the scenes and had a lot of fun, but I had a chance to go to the church seven days a week, you know, so I was going constantly, you know. I was always there either setting up chairs or doing sound or working on this, working on that, because there was always room for volunteers, for people to, you know, just volunteer their time and go down and work in the ministry. And kind of what was fun about that was that not only could you volunteer your time, but you could go to the studies. You know, it was not like it cost you anything. It wasn't not like there was a membership fee or something. You could just go. And the neat thing at that time was that of the few places around Southern Cal, Calvary always had something going on seven days a week. <laughs> Sometimes twice. You know, you could do things twice on Sunday sometimes twice on other days of the week. And uh, like Thursday, you know, I used to go to Romaine study on Thursday morning. Yeah, Romaine. You know, <laughs> Romaine. And that's what I mean by being spoiled. You know, I, I got Romaine. I loved Romaine. Romaine was so cool. He led this Thursday morning study that seemed to be full of women. Because <laughs> no men could be there because they're all working, mostly. Said me, <laughs> I was preloading. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't go there. Don't go there. But um, in my studies, I was there for shipping out. <laughs> I was there during classic Romaine, you know, where it was like James. We're into James. Turn your Bible. Open to James. You know. I went through James 1 through 5, you know, I mean, all of James, you know, we, we did James regularly, and then every time that he'd go somewhere, he'd do James, you know, or he'd fill in for Chuck, he'd do James. Whenever he's going to fill in for Chuck, man, I was there. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, watch this. This is going to be great. Watch everybody squirm. Because, <laughs> you see, Romaine was this little short guy, kind of like my wife, you know, my wife's not so big, you know, she's kind of like a little tiny thing, you know, kind of like my mother, you know, my mother was a little four foot eleven, you know, but... That little mother of mine, you know, no, I'm not calling her a mother, I'm just saying, <laughs> that little mother of mine, man, she could backhand it with the best of them. She had a mouth that could cut you to shreds, you know, with her sarcasm. She was a little truck stop waitress, and boy, was she, like, mouthy. Then I met Romaine. <laughs> I was like, wow, talk about a combination. Here's my mother on one hand, here's Romaine on the other. Whoa, <laughs> boy, when my mom got saved, it was great, you know, she even got a chance to enjoy Romaine, you know, it's kind of humorous to see that going on. I wish the two of them would have conversed at some point in time. It would have been humorous. But the thing that was always good about Romain was that he was always talking about how Christians were weird, you know, and they were, you know, they do all these strange things like they love each other, you know, and he would give all this positive stuff, you know, in his studies, but then he'd also talk about how, you know, people would come in for counseling, you know, and he'd start saying, well, are you reading your Bible? You know, first thing out of his mouth, are you reading your Bible? Well, maybe the first thing might have been, are you a Christian? Are you saved? Do you know Jesus? You know? Then he'd say, are you reading your Bible? And if they said no, he'd say, get out of here. You know, Because literally, that's 
what counseling boils down to is that if you're not reading your Bible, then what are you doing? You know, going to a church. What are you doing? You know, playing or pretending. So he would go through these little, you know, kind of set routines. You know, that he would be praying ahead of time at his counseling appointment. You know, he'd be going, "Ooh, you know, I can't wait to get a hold." You know, I've been studying my scriptures. I got my Bible ready. You know, I've got all of this lined out. Lord, just put them in my hands. I'll get them straightened out for you. I'm looking forward to this. Boy, watch it, man. God, I'll get another one for you. And they'd come in and say something like, "Well, you know, Romaine, we we've been coming to church for oh." three or four, you know, about a year now, and we got saved a year ago, and, you know, we've been, we've been, you know, living together, and, and Romain would be going, yeah, and I was already, I was just getting ready to open my mouth when he said, and we prayed about it, decided to move apart, you know, we, we decided that we needed to be separate, and he's like, and he'd stop, and he'd go, and the Lord stole it, he took it away, I was all ready to beat him, and then they go and come to me, and they're all tender, and they're all repenting, and they're wanting to get involved in a Bible study, and go to premarital counseling, and do this, he says, I was all ready to eat him up, <laughs> that's Romaine, <laughs> God would always take Romaine's thunder away, and then he'd teach us what he wanted to do, because he's a Marine Corps drill instructor, he knew, you know, kind of like what whining was about, because he'd tell Christians, Quit your whining, your griping, your sniveling, your sneaking. You got God. God loves you. You know, God died for you. What's your problem? You know, I mean, literally, that's Romaine. And uh, he talked about how Christians were like slimy, you know, fish. You know, they're like, you know, just, you know, squirming fish, you know, trying to get out, you know, trying to get away, trying to die back in the water, you know. God's got them, you know. <laughs> it was really cool. I was spoiled rotten. I mean, Romaine gave me everything I ever needed about counseling. I used it consistently all my life. Worked. <laughs> you know, um, challenged myself. I always asked myself where I was coming from, what I was doing, how I was going, where I was at, you know, what things basics should have been doing, you know, didn't do it, whether I had a relationship. And Romaine always talked as though he talked to God every day, you know. And that's kind of what Chuck did and Romaine did. And a lot of people did because they did. <laughs> In other words, we're not making this up. <laughs> this isn't like Theology 101, this is God intervening 101. Real life with a Christian is real life with a Christian. <laughs> and that's my point. A lot of times people get into this whole idea that they need to, you know, fix things, change things, work things, do things, be things, act things, or become things. You know, and if God died for you, I think he took care of everything, didn't he? I mean, in my opinion, that's kind of the way it works. That Jesus died on the cross, you know, so that he would be the propitiation for our sins. That he has literally taken away the power and the sting of death. He has removed the enmity that we had with God. He has cast down the obstacles that now prevented us before from talking to God and God talking to us. And now there's an open way that we can come to God fully by way of grace and mercy and seek his forgiveness and his kindness and his gentleness and be loved by him. Man, I was like digging it. Cool. God did it all. What do I got to do? Where do I sign? You know, and part of the, the whole process I was taught, you know, was that, hey, you're going to spend the rest of your life, you know, being changed from glory to glory, from the image that you were, blech, to the image that you become, yay, to wonderful, oh boy. And I used to look at these little Greg Laurie tracks, because I got saved out of Calvary Riverside, you know, and I didn't get discipled there or anything. I just went to a concert there, and, you know, I lived right around the corner in Norco, and it was humorous because, you know, Greg had these little tracks that was been born again, you know, and it always showed this little guy running up going, Daddy, Daddy! <laughs> you know, I always went, yeah, yeah! So I always thought that was the way it was. Now, I'm told... Nowadays, you know, we got to make sure you're really a Christian. I thought, really what? What's really? I mean, are you really, really, really trying to figure out if they really are? Because really, I'm wondering what you really want. Because <laughs> really, I don't understand. What's really a Christian? You know, like, do you have to have, like, all the four spiritual laws down? Because we made those up. Bill Bright came up with them, you know, not so long ago. That's not scriptural. It's just a good idea to use those scriptures 
calling them the four spiritual laws, that we apply it so that we can present it in a way that people understand. It doesn't mean there's a Bible that says, you know, these are the four spiritual laws, and then you go through them. <laughs> and I don't know if you realize this, but there's not a Roman way, you know, that suddenly in your Bible you find this Roman way where you go through Romans this and Romans that, and Roman here and Roman there and Roman this and Romania. Uh uh. It's just a way of presenting what God is doing and done for you and how you could get to know Him. Because you see, God really can come to a person any way He wants to. Pardon me, but He can knock you off your horse, kind of like Paul, you know. If you really want to be one of them persecuting people, you know, well, go out there and watch God knock you down. <laughs> hmm. Might not be a good idea, will it? Maybe you shouldn't be persecuting people. Maybe it might be an easier way. I know, for me, it was pretty easy for me. I just looked around and I said, a buddy of mine took me to a concert and I looked there around and I said, wow, check out all these people, man. They're glowing. And they were. At that time, they were like, not like, you know, the cult kind of glowing. Where it's, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy, happy, happy. I'm one of those happy people. Happy, happy, happy. And everybody would look the same like happy, happy. No, these people were like, wow. They were like individuals, but they were shining. I mean, they were like, Ooh, what have they got? And I mean, really, everyone wanted to know, what have they got? Because you see, on a Friday night, this was like a little tiny old church that just had glass sides, you know, well, kind of like those windows that, you know, you open and close, kind of like, you know, long ones going way up, you know, like two stories or whatever. You know, you kind of have to do those kind of shutter things, you know. Well, people would be sitting on the inside and then standing on the outside trying to get in and watching the concert and looking inside. And it was like, there's Greg. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen Greg? You know Greg. You know, he had this little, little uh, board, you know, he was, it was actually a sketch pad, you know, that he would roll over these papers, you know, and he'd start drawing, you know, and telling a story, you know. And, hey, you know, it was, it was cute. I loved it. You know, I was like... It was Jonah, you know, and I kind of thought it was cool. But I wanted what these people had. I didn't get the whole message down about this sin thing. I didn't understand, you know, sin. What did I do? Did I do anything wrong? Not that I know of. I think I was a pretty good kid. My mother said so. My father said so. Well, actually, my father, who knew what he said so? <laughs> my stepdad said so. You know, everybody seemed to think that was a pretty good kid, you know. Now, I'll admit, maybe I was a little obnoxious as a hippie. Maybe I thought I knew it all. Maybe. <laughs> but I didn't know that because, after all, nobody could argue with me. I was always right. <laughs> so, when I saw the love that these people had, oh, I wanted that, man, because I knew I was missing something. I, you know, the love is what I wanted because that, that kind of love was what, man, I had been missing all my life. So, I wanted that. And you know, that's kind of what Romaine said was so different about Jesus Christ. He goes, you people are weird, you know. He says, you, you, you love each other, you know, that's disgusting, you know. You just get all huggy and, and happy and, you know, joyful and, you know, man, you know, I just, that's just too much, you know. You guys are just weird, you know. It's like, it's like you're like Jesus or something. You know, he's teasing, obviously. But that's my point. What are you like? Are you like loving? Are you like bitter? Are you like, you know, wanting to be, people want to be around you because you kind of like got this really cool experience, you know, you're like, man, you know, <laughs> check it, man. Not only do I get to do what I want to do, I get to make a fool of myself for Jesus. <laughs> and trust me, I can do that regularly. <laughs> and I've been doing it all my life. Being just kind of foolish for God. Or, you could be upright. <clears throat> Put on tie and suit and coat. We could be there. And we can discuss God and still be with God. Because you see, we've got an organ. Ta -da! I hate organs. <laughs> I really do. I, you know, I've been to denominational churches, and I enjoy them. You know, I've been to Catholic Church, you know, I was there for the charismatic movement, and it was like, wow, man, these people are getting saved. These Catholics are cool, you know. Who would have thought that born-again Catholics would be so radical, you know, for Jesus? Of course, people forget nowadays that 
there are Christians in the Catholic Church. <laughs> Who would have thought? Boy, back in the Jesus movement, we didn't think so until, guess what? Holy Spirit decided to wipe them out too. Who? God. Got them. Hey, that's cool. Man, check them out, man. You got a priest walking around with sandals on, you know, talking about being born again. <laughs> wow. Folk mass? Cool. <laughs> That's different. Of course, Catholic Church didn't know quite what to do with it. They even had this little pope called John Paul, you know, they had to get rid of, or people still don't know why he was only in office for such a short period of time. And most of us that showed up, or the people that showed up there that were born again Christians standing around, you know, watching the pope for the, what, a few days he was there, they were glad to see him when he said, hey, we want the Holy Spirit back in the church. You know, we love the born again Christians. You know, we love them. You know, we're all one body. And, Unfortunately, he didn't last more than, what, 183 days or something? Hmm. You think there was some hanky-panky going on? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. Maybe. But I do believe that I'm going to meet that guy in heaven. <laughs> no problem there. Although I know some of you have a problem with Catholics. <laughs> okay, well, some might be not be saved. You know, that's like any church. But then, you know, I kind of went, Boy, Lord, this was cool. You know, I've got like born again Christians that love each other in the Catholic Church. I got born again Christians that love each other. You know, at Calvary's. I said, man, where else are there people? You know. And then I had roommates that was from like Assembly of God. And I went, Assembly of God, what's that? So I went there. It was like, ooh, these guys are kind of cool. You know, they're a little kind of carried away on that you know tongue thing, but you know, hey, I like it. You know, been there, done that. You know, I know what they're saying. I understand it. <laughs> of course, I'd already been trained to Calvary, so <laughs> thank God I had some of that background to understand what was going on in that background. Then I kind of went. Yeah, and you know, I'm going to check out you know, some of these things like Melody Land, you know. Melody Land's down the street. I went down there and checked that out. That was cool. Then I went over to Full Gospel Businessmen Association. That was cool. Then I went over to TBN, you know, because it was a little studio at the time, you know. That was cool. You know, I said, man, Bill Bright's over there. You know, I said, I'll go check that out. Oh, wow, you know, we've got a Jewish Gentile fellowship. I'll go check that out. Man, you know, everywhere I went, I found the love of God. And you know what? People just loved each other. Man, they weren't worried about what you were thinking and stinking thinking or anything like Romaine used to say. You know, don't get none of that stinking thinking, you know, that goes on in, you know, kind of churches where they're dead, you know, kind of like talking about religion, talking about this, that, and the other thing, and whining and griping and complaining. But rather, keep your thinking on Jesus. And you know what? <laughs> Reading your word, doing what he says, abiding in his word, you'll be there. I went, hi, hi. Okay. Cut it quick, you know, cut it too quick. You know, cut out all the superficial crap, like he used to say, because anytime we had an issue, we'd come running to it, oh, Romaine, Romaine, oh my God, oh my God, they're releasing a movie, we got to do something, Media Spotlight told us that, you know what, it's bad, it's bad, it's going to, you know, convert all these Christians into being non-Christians, and he'd go, and look at us like, we were stupid, <laughs> I mean, Romaine had a way of looking at you that you went, I don't think I want to talk about this one, and he'd just say simple things like, is God God? And you'd suddenly go, mm -hmm. and run off, <laughs> if you were smart. If not, then you'd stand there and argue about whether God was in control, whether God was true to his word, whether the word of God was real, whether you were reading it, whether you were doing it, whether you were believing in it, when God says, I am the Lord thy God. <laughs> ah, really? <laughs> Man, are we acting like it? I don't think so when we're worried about it. You know, it's like, gee whiz, God. You know, I kind of thought, you know, that you weren't in control, so I thought maybe I had to do something about it, you know. Sorry, Lord, I didn't know you put people in charge, you know. It's kind of like, nowadays, don't we have to, like, you know, get politically motivated, you know, and do this and that and the other thing and fight this battle, that and battle and everything else because we wrestle against flesh and blood? Oh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Oh, Another famous Romaine. Romaine would take scriptures and misquote them on purpose. See if you're paying attention. And unfortunately today, most Christians aren't paying attention because they're misquoting God and think they're right. And the thing that I find interesting is that we wouldn't have found that in those days. We were messed up because we didn't know what we were doing. It's like we read something in the Bible and run out and try it. You know, it's like, well, you know, it says, you know, Love your enemy, so let's go run out there and try it, you know, and see if it works. And my golly, it seemed to be working, you know. I mean, man, there were a lot of missionaries that ran out there, you know, to 
deepest, darkest, kind of like, you know, places, and some of them died as martyrs, you know, we heard about that, you know, it's like, they gave up football careers, they gave up being in the limelight, they gave up American Idol, oh wait, they didn't have that in those days, they gave up being, you know, like, number one movie contracts, number one recording artist contracts in order to serve the Lord, not in ministry that looked like in front of all the people, man, you know, that was love, you know, that kind of seemed like that was cool, so... Some of us thought that was the way to go. I wonder if it was. What do you think? Out of the spoils won in battles, did they dedicate to maintain the house of the Lord? 1 Chronicles 26, 27. Physical force is stored in the bowels of the earth, in the coal mines, which came from the fire heat that burned up great forests in ancient ages. And so spiritual force is stored in the depths of our being, through the very pain which we cannot understand. Someday we shall find that the spoils we have won from our trials were just preparing us to become true great hearts in the pilgrim's progress and to lead our fellow pilgrims triumphantly through trial to the city of the king but let us never forget the source of helping other people must be victorious suffering the whining murmuring pang never does anybody any good paul did not carry a cemetery with him but a chorus of victorious praise and the harder the trial the more he trusted and rejoiced shouting from the very altar of sacrifice. He said, Yea, and if I be offered upon the service and sacrifice of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Lord, help me this day to draw strength from all that comes to me. God doesn't let the nation go to hell because he's sending a nation to hell. God lets the nation go the direction it's going because he's testing you to see where you are. My personal opinion has been all along that all of the presidents, no matter who they are, has challenged, tested, and tried the heart of our people, meaning the people of God, to see whether or not they would honor God or reject God in those authorities that he's given for our benefit. Because it's easy to whine about who's in charge. It's easy to complain about what's going on. It's easy to promote dissension, division, strife, anger, malice, wrath, backbiting. It's easy to do those things of the flesh. But you know what's hard? You know what's the hardest thing I've ever heard of? I mean, it just blows my mind. It should be the number one thing, you know, on you know everybody's wall you know that I always thought you know I always thought that as a boarding and Christian this should be our mantra this should be our model this should be the number one thing you know in our mind and our eyes and as everywhere we go you know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son oh no I don't mean John 316 written under our eyes I don't mean you know only doing it for those that we like you know like oh well let's witness to the choir because after all these people we like them so let's get them saved no, I mean, let's go to the child molester. Let's go to the drunken addict. Let's go to the crackhead. Let's go to the people that are hated and despised of society. And let's tell them God so loved the world. And see whether or not Christians do. Because you see, I think that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because I think that God does love the world. I think God loves the people in the world. I think God loves the people that are dying without salvation and that He is going to send them to hell. But I think that God is so in love with the world that He's willing to give even Himself in the form of His Son and die to self that we ought to do the same as Paul did. And we whine about politics? Pardon me, but if I was Romaine today, I think I'd say put up or shut up. Because either put up your Christianity to be examined by everyone around you as a light shining in the wilderness, 
Meaning that you're willing to embrace the love of God and reach out to those people that are desperately mixed up, messed up, confused, abused, and just really in a mess and love them. Or quit saying you're a Christian. Don't pretend that you're born again. Go back to the sandbox and be religious. Go back to Plato and make yourself into the image you want to be with Gumby, you know, and the donkey. But you know, with claymation there is an interesting thing. There was a different kind of claymation that used to be on TV. It was a little boy and his dog. And it was kind of cute. It always had kind of a Christian theme. It was done by the Lutherans, you know. You know the Lutherans, those people that people are saying, oh, well, you know, Lutherans, ha, huh? you know, they're denominational. We, you know, we don't do denominations. You know, we do non-denomination. We do evangelical. I do God. I don't know about you, because God so loved the world that I do whatever it is that God wants to do wherever he wants to do it. I do Jesus wherever he wants to go because wherever he wants to go, I want to be. So if Jesus says to me, I want you to go and what? Witness to the Mormon? If I want you to go and witness to the Jehovah's Witness, if I want you to go and just show the love without witnessing at all, then I think I need to go. Because, you know, there's an awful lot of people that are around me that are inspiring me to do that thing. I think of Francis Chan, I think of Rick Warren, I think of Greg Laurie, I think of people that, despite them having differences with other people, which I'm sure they do, they work with them in the one important issue of all of our lives, the salvation of a soul. Because everything after that is commentary. It's just gravy. There is nothing more important than saving someone from hell. Until we get that message down, I don't know what to tell you except what Romaine might have told me, you know, when I used to whine about Oh no, the movie industry. Oh no, the television. Oh no, the radio. Oh no, the news. Oh no, Fox. Oh no, CBN, TBN. Oh no, the banks. Oh no, the stock market. I'll tell you what he told me. Stick a thumb in it. Because that's what you're acting like. That's what he'd say. Stick a thumb in it. He wouldn't say anything after that. He'd just say stick a thumb in it. We got the message. More often than not, when you have an issue that you think is so important, can I give you a hint? Can I give you a real, you know, positive way of looking at all of your issues and problems? We call it the Word of God. The reason being is that God said it, and He did it. If God can't handle it, neither can you.